the broadcast of the regular meeting of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission Audit Subcommittee will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission Audit Subcommittee for May 25th, 2021. I am Robert Pino and I am the chair of this committee. As we begin, I'll note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared public health emergency. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and posted to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota open meeting laws. Uh, before I ask the clerk to call the roll, um, I want to uh, take a moment um, to acknowledge that today is the one year anniversary of the death of George Floyd. And I would ask that everyone present uh, join me in a moment of silence in recognition of his loss of life. Thank you very much. And at this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Commissioner Crockett. Here. Commissioner Sparks is absent. Chair Pino. Here. There are two members present. Let the record reflect that we do in fact have a quorum. Next, we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which has been posted for public access uh, to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. Um, I will uh, move to adopt this agenda um, and ask the uh, clerk to call the roll. Commissioner Crockett. Aye. Chair Pino. Aye. There are two ayes. The motion carries and the agenda is adopted. Next is the item um, of uh, accepting minutes for the meeting of April 27th, 2021. Uh, and I will also move to accept those minutes and ask the clerk to call the roll. Commissioner Crockett. Aye. Chair Pino. Aye. There are two ayes. The motion carries and the minutes for uh, April 2021 meeting are accepted. Uh, the next order of business is the acceptance of public comment. I will open the floor and invite comments from the community. We will limit public comment to no more than two minutes per speaker. Uh, with that, are there any community members on the line or here with us on teams who wish to address the commission? All right, I've been told that there are no callers on the line. Um, and I, with that in mind, and seeing that there's no one who has raised their hand, uh, I will move on to our next item of business, which is unfinished business from our April meeting uh, regarding coaching, which was postponed from April um, in response to a uh, presentation that the full committee um, recently um, received on coaching um, and we can continue that unfinished business uh, and talk about potentially the uh, the beginning of uh, a research and study formulating some fundamental questions that we want to um, ask of the city uh, police department and uh, other interested uh, entities um, with that in mind uh, I will take just a moment to pull up that um, document that we uh, discussed in our April meeting regarding the the research and study process um, so that way we have it um, available. I know we might not be able to share it last minute. It's just coming up in my head now. I apologize for our uh, staff that control the uh, screen sharing. I will see if I can find that and send it to Ted. OK. Um, but um, the, the main point that we have uh, to focus on 
uh, in regards to coaching is really starting to formulate the uh, fundamental questions that we want to ask, uh, that we're interested in finding the answers of, uh, and then having a discussion on feasibility and a timeline um, established. Um, and and uh, Commissioner Crockett, uh, I'd be more than happy to just go into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Uh, and of course, staff may jump in uh, as necessary to clarify or inform. Um, about uh, the discussion that we, uh, the presentation that we heard in our last full meeting um, and talk about what we're interested in learning more about and exploring this process of coaching. It seemed to be a lot wider in scope than uh, our initial conversations uh, were, and uh, I'm glad we, we waited. Uh, what were your thoughts on the presentation? Yeah, you know, thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me the, the, the floor on that. Um, it was it was a super it was super interesting. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of it, it, there's kind of a lot of gray around mm -hmm. it, I feel like. Um, and it wasn't a very like black and white, like this is what it is, this is what it isn't. But there's a lot of gray. Um, and one of my questions uh, kind of was like, you know, where 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 does it become like hidden? You know where mm -hmm. where are these uh, these these coaching um, pieces that that isn't articulated in every um, that, or isn't recorded or you know mm -hmm. isn't articulated? It, it just sounded like it was a lot of it was up to up to discretion of yeah. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it I mean, didn't sound like somebody could make the decision whether it would be reported or not. Yeah, I think that I think there's one part that is is very clear that I've gathered um, is that there are uh, there are state laws of uh, data privacy um, that uh, are uh, designed overall with a broad spectrum of any uh, public employees in mind um, to protect certain private data um, and not intentionally with the idea of policing in mind, um, but anyone who works for the public sector in the state. Um, and that idea of if there is some sort of workforce related um, uh, issue or training of some sort, think, you know, like uh, working in, you know, uh, public works or, you know, the the transportation system and stuff like that. Um, and somebody makes some sort of mistake or needs some sort of additional training, then uh, they don't. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but sure. they don't want to have everything publicly disclosed for for two reasons is what I've gathered. Mm -hmm. One point was more of a uh, you know, a uh, protection of that individual in case, you know, they they aren't overly criticized for, uh, you know, let's say you're a metro operator of some mm -hmm. sort and, you know, you make an administrative error. Does that need to be publicly disclosed when all you need to do is make a, a correction of some sort to uh, to coach them in how and uh, remind them of how to do that process correctly? Um, and then the other part of it that I think is more relevant to what we're talking about here is is a, a concern of, of timeliness um, because people are public, uh, you know, civil servants, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll use that term generally, just meaning everyone who you know is paid for through tax dollar funds, that sort of thing. Um, they they have certain standards of correction you know, of, of meeting what we're defining as discipline, right? And uh, you could either go through a, a more lengthy discipline process, which I think was, uh, I, I tried to pull that sort of questioning out um, mm -hmm. uh, when when I was given the turn to, to speak. Um, and it's clear that there are a lot of uh, hands in the cookie jar 
you know, of uh, mm -hmm. different entities that uh, want to make sure that certain standards are in place when they're talking about actual discipline of civil servants. Um, and coaching is a way to, uh, and I believe when you have uh, those more uh, administrative uh, uh, needs to re-educate and, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, repeat, repeat the training essentially, you know, uh, yeah. that, uh, that, that is the, the tool that's more timely. And I think that is the big, uh, disconnect that I realized here in a lot of this is that you have a uh, a big old paintbrush of coaching versus discipline policy that is for the most part seems to work well across the entire enterprise um, mm -hmm. and then in this one specific very high uh, you know, high stress environment of policing and uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, accountability and uh, a very particular job set of, you know, carrying around a firearm or having the ability to detain individuals. Uh, it's, it is fit under a completely different context from an outsider's perspective from from our civilian perspective of saying yeah but you know someone who's working in you know health and human services when they get coached they've they never run the risk of potentially killing someone you know right. and it's that generalization of the policies uh that i think what what i'm interested in is seeing if other states outside of Minnesota have also seen this sort of issue of we're painting with a very broad brush here and uh, have other states considered either making amendments to that or having a, a different type of process that still allows for the timeliness. I think the timeliness is really important. It's exactly. it's it's the public disclosure that at the end of the day that I think is the crux of the concern. I mean, the terminology is the terminology and I, and I don't want to try to rework the whole, the whole structure. I think the main point is that people are informed of what's happening when there is some sort of correction. And, and to your point, the, you know, how specifically, how do things end up, uh, being assigned to coaching? What are those particular levers, if you will, that are switched in the matrix to to make sure that things are classified in a certain way? Yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. I I I took the liberty of, you know, uh, you know, taking input from uh, other uh, other commissioners when they were asking questions and, you know, uh, jotting down a few myself, there, there are some things that, you know, just some basic like metrics of really just understanding what's happening here in terms of, of coaching and discipline. And I think it's possible that this information already exists, but we just need to like bring it to the forefront of, you know, percentages of, of, coaching versus discipline uh timelines of coaching versus discipline um types of complaints and the percentage of coaching versus the percentage of discipline uh and and trying to get an understanding down of uh not just the matrix and what it says but the actual practice of the matrix and uh you know uh, is Every time, you know, someone, uh, you know, uses a uh, squad car to run through a red light unnecessarily, uh, have the same 
response every time? How consistent are we in implementing the same and broad term, whether you want to call it coaching or discipline, correction? Um, mm -hmm. it is the same type of correction applied? And if not, why not? Um, I'd be very interested in looking at, at questions like that to really just get like a, a, a basic understanding of where we're at. And I think it's honestly, it's a, a core component of, you know, uh, our, our charter of understanding the trends of uh, police complaints and civilian responses to those complaints, you know? Andrew has his hand up. Oh, please, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to jump in quick just to make sure that I'm following like the workflow process. I think some of um like what you identified in terms of because it's actually I mean I know the next thing on the agenda it's something that we've done for that one yep. is sort of that looking across uh, you know various jurisdictions and kind mm -hmm. of seeing you know what what are the comparable items uh, in those yep. areas. I think that's definitely helpful just in figuring out. I think that's kind of something that that's missed sometimes is it, you know it's helpful to go into this knowing what the universe looks like. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to treating things like a one off. And, you know, this is definitely not something that's explicitly, you know, a Minneapolis thing that I, I know just, you know, from um, like researching and, you know, working with other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, it exists, you know, across the board. And I'm sure that, you know, in, like civilians in Minneapolis are not the first ones to have raised questions on it. So I think yeah. seeing kind of what other people have done and, you know, how that's been addressed could be really helpful. So that's definitely something that I think we can. Um, put together if you want us to kind of find some similar jurisdictions in Minneapolis or, you know, uh, if you have, you know, any um, municipalities in mind or something that we can yeah. um, get that together and send that back out. The other thing I'd mentioned, and I think we talked about this last time, but um, was we had that uh, coaching dashboard that was done for a, a coaching study in 2017 that's on, yeah. I believe you can get to it uh, through the website. And you know, that we was look up at to something. 2017 data, right? Yep, yep, it yep. went through. Uh, I can't remember if it was the end of 17, but it was sometime in 2017 was the, the, the end of it. So yeah. there's probably a way that we can look at either updating that same dashboard or just or, you know, like doing something similar with just a new, a new, uh, basically a new data set. Because I mean, obviously yeah. there's, you know, there's data, there's data practices stuff around some of this. So we have to make sure that we, um, yeah. you know, are following all the procedures in place. But I, go ahead. Yeah, believe me, my, my, my ideal is uh, I would love all of this to be automated. You know, anytime there's any sort of uh, complaint, uh, strip the the personally identifiable information out of it. And, uh, you know, anytime a complaint is, um, uh, what's the term? Um, OPCR uh, verifies or um, substantiates, is that the term? Um, Basically, I, mean, I, I, guess, I, I guess confirms. it depends on what uh, what category you're talking about. Exactly. So, well, when, when, uh, a decision is rendered one way or another, um, uh, and there uh, uh, of a complaint, you know, it would be great to within you know 48 hours with little to no more administrative work, uh, just have that publicly available in the same sort of dashboard of just saying, hey. You know, uh, and, and we can start with the type of information that's available to us now, and then in time, when if and when we're able to expand on the details, uh, and we can expand, you know, we can help make that information more fruitful. But you know, it's clear through that dashboard that there is some level of information that can be legally publicly disclosable. Um, so. Now it's just a question for me right now of how frequent, you know, uh, is there some sort of clause in there that says we have to wait a certain number of months, years, something like that, or can we get up to the day information, up to the week information, uh, you know, such that it is right now and what is allowable. Yeah, and so I think that yeah, going. I mean, updating that dashboard is probably helpful just because we have the precedent of it already. You know, it already exists. It's something we've done in the past. And if you if you go to it, I mean, I think it does have some helpful information about timelines and subject matter and everything. Um, we, yeah, I mean, just to the point that was I think kind of made. It's like I feel like we've definitely talked about this issue, you know, a lot. And you know, and it, so I mean, just making it clear that. I think there's like there's the two different conversations. There's like you know there's there's a discussion about you know what is this, how does this exist, you know why does and I, I feel like a lot of that has probably been answered in its entirety. So at this point, yeah. it's you know like testifying something you had said where, you know this is like we're not questioning whether or not the system that can exist. It does, but we want to know more about it. Yep. 
Um, and, and so I think that updating the dashboard is probably it, it, you know, and, and having that information readily available for an analysis is probably you know the easiest way to do that. Um, just because you know we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we can take what's you know, what's already been done and build upon it. Yeah. Um, and provide that kind of insight into what's you know uh, like timelines, you know how this process works, what it's used for, et cetera. And I'm I'm really particularly interested in you know it doesn't even need to be a formal evaluation you know it's just getting into the healthy practice of uh of the iterative evaluation process in practice of looking at you know this is we had a great presentation on uh how coaching is designed you know and I think it's it's fair to say in anything, there's a difference between the design and the practice to some degree. And let's let's not be afraid to explore and see if there are differences. And if there are, we should look at them and ask ourselves, why are there differences? If there aren't and things are working uh, as intentioned, uh, I think we could look at that as well. Um, and really try to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, we are making assessments off of you know, efficacy, how well this is actually working as intentioned, and two, uh, do those intentions, the way things are written out in policies, match the values that we see uh, in our communities and uh, here in the public sector, do all of those different perspectives match in some sort of way that's harmonious and you know well intentioned? Yep, you know, uh, definitely. And so I can um, I can work with staff to take a look at that dashboard and just kind of figure out what it would take to. I'm, I'm looking at it right now um, to you know to get that updated. Just because then I mean again uh, like to the point that I think has been made you know. Uh, multiple times I like this yeah, meeting already it's like just info. having the actual data is you know like that that facilitates a different discussion than just yep. discussing you know processes and policies and stuff so I think that's one that's definitely worth having so yeah. um, I'll, I'll I'll get back to you with an estimate on like what it would take to get that one done and then I think there's a couple easy examples too for just kind of like what this you know uh, like precedent for this existing in other places as well yeah and don't worry I mean this is uh, this is one of those uh, topics that I believe we're going to be talking about for a while uh, I intend to have this coaching conversation at every one of our subcommittee meetings and learning bits and pieces more and more uh, to slowly gather all the right information that we can um, and you know, come back to the commission with something that is substantial, not just something that uh, you know, is our fastest answer. Um, oh, pardon me. Um, uh, Commissioner Crockett, do you have any other, uh, I mean, is from the perspective of fundamental questions and framing things that you're interested in, in and around coaching, um, are there uh, any other questions that you were thinking of that uh, might be of interest to you? Um, yeah, no, honestly, um, I, th I think you hit, you hit a lot of them mm -hmm. is just a big fundamental question of like, is the design matching the practice yeah. um, and the the kind of questions to articulate in between there mm -hmm. um, I think is is just a, the biggest the biggest point okay um, I, I'll provide uh, ample opportunity for Commissioner Sparks to um, uh, join in on the conversation next time um, I did have uh, a few other commissioners who uh, we're curious about uh, questions as well that uh, sent in via email. I believe you were CC'd on the email as well, Commissioner Crockett. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, it's a long list that I see from one particular individual, um, but I, I do resonate with a lot of these questions um, in uh, in attempts to not go through the long list. Uh, I. I would like to just put them in the chat and then we could have them displayed uh, within the meeting minutes. Is that appropriate, Madam Clerk? Yes, we can do that. Okay. Then I'm going to just make sure 
Um, and we can have continued discussions on these. A lot of them were uh, some of the uh, the same questions that we kind of brought up of, you know, how often uh, is there coaching and what types of conduct is coaching and uh, are there multiple, uh, you know, how many officers are coached multiple times and for what types of um, offenses, stuff like that, um, as well as going on to the the in general, the uh, uh, process and understanding of legal settlements and negotiations um, uh, in terms of discipline, because I think that is a whole other kettle of fish that uh, we could have a completely separate meeting about um, and really get an understanding of uh, how that plays into, you know, what the, the overall uh, role of public disclosure um, and uh, you know, making sure that we understand it to the fullest extent. Um, but yeah, just want to make sure that those questions are available for staff so we, we can start uh, looking into these uh, a little bit more and really have a, a, a more firm understanding of you know, practice. Um, and unless we have uh, more to discuss here, uh, I'll table this um, for next meeting, continue it under unfinished business. Um, I know w we didn't really have a, a directive from staff on this apart from the the dashboard. Um, I'm OK with that right now. Um, is there any other uh, unintended or maybe I may have just you know, had a light bulb shine in your head, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, any other directives that you think are worthwhile think, on terms of coaching? No, I mean, looking at a couple of these questions, I think the dashboard answers a lot of them. Um, yeah, you know, I figured. Course. And so I think, like, you know, that's like just the, you know, um, mm -hmm. especially, you know, given like this um, scope of this body, uh, you know, I think like going the data route is, you know, like that's that, that allows us to have a conversation that's driven by, you know, yeah. um, numbers and, you know, I'm like all for the it. dashboard itself. So. I think going that route is probably the best way to proceed. OK. Um, then with that in mind, um, I will uh, table this coaching um, discussion under unfinished business to be brought up at our next meeting um, and uh, begin our conversation on no knock warrants. Um, and uh, in light of that, I would like to acknowledge that uh, Andrew Hawkins did in fact provide a, um, a document to this subcommittee entitled Comparison of Police Department Policy and Procedures on No-Knock Warrants with MPD. Uh, this uh, was published in part and I do believe that was my mistake. I, I handed a uh, an unfinished document a little bit early um, to the clerk. We do have uh, two preceding pages which give us uh, comparisons uh, between Minneapolis Police Department and the police departments of Cleveland, Ohio, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Oakland, California, which I do believe the clerk now has um, and will provide for uh, public uh, disclosure um, on limbs um, after this meeting, but um, Chair Chair Pino, are, yes. which document are you referring to? Uh, it is the one that was sent to us about yeah this morning. Two Lisa, hours on it. Yes. Oh, this morning. Okay. This morning. Yep. Yep. I we actually have that document. Oh, great. If we could bring that up um, and uh, Mr. Hawkins, if you would be uh, so kind as to give us just a, a broad overview um, of uh, how we ended up choosing uh, these uh, comparison cities and what your overall thoughts were uh, in compare and contrast with the uh, police departments. 
Sure, and like for this, I'm actually going to. Uh, I've enlisted the help of uh, Chris uh, of Christopher Bantha. He's one of our new case investigators. Um, okay. He's been inc like incredibly helpful with uh, like kind of helping with the extra lift on this. So uh, like Christopher was the one that put uh, like like most of this substantive document together. So I'm going to let him go ahead and um, like speak to the methodology behind it and answer any questions you might have. All right. Well, it's very nice to meet you, and and please take it away. Nice to meet you. Um, so the uh, the city's chosen were. Um, just comparing a list of population similar size to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, certain jurisdictions were excluded. That's covered in the first paragraph um, because there are certain jurisdictions where no knock warrants are prohibited by state law. Mm -hmm. um, there are also other municipalities which have prohibited them. So, you know, they're not great for comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I selected those cities, it was because they were a similar population size to Minneapolis. And also their policy documents are available online, which is a, a large barrier to doing comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, so just going through the uh, and then the, the rubric from uh, Nonoc, Minnesota. Yes. Um, next to that is where the Minneapolis policy and procedure was compared. And there is a, a slight limiting comparison, shall we say, because as you can see from the Nonoc rubric, um, you know, a, a lot of these regulations come from state law, so they might yeah. not be within the four corners of a police policy, but there may be a state law that affects it. Um, I did not compare state law for all the jurisdictions, um, but I did look at the policies and have a comparison. I would say the main thing that stands out is that um, no knock warrants are considered high risk across all three jurisdictions, mm -hmm. um, which does require a SWAT team to be present. Uh, it, there was one exception where if someone is arrested away from the property, then it's not considered high risk. Okay. Um, but if it's a no-knock warrant where people are present, it is high risk. Uh, some of the policies required, provided guidance on applying for a warrant. They often required supervisor approval and sometimes even attorney approval mm -hmm. from the prosecuting offices. Um, and then in every single comparison, uh, similar procedure with the courts. So the courts have to receive a copy of the, the warrant and inventory when it's been, after it's been executed. Uh, that's usually within 10 days, though within 10 days of being issued, it must be executed and returned to the court. Okay. The one other thing that I thought of note was that in Oakland, um, it's actually not in the police policy, it was in a training bulletin, which from what I can tell is, is similar to policy, but it's just interesting. It's part of the training bulletin, mm -hmm. but they do require reports uh, reg regularly to be made. So they have an office of an inspector general who audits the warrant compliance with the policy with the training bulletin every year. Um, and they also have to have reports done on a, I believe, monthly basis by uh, supervisors on warrants they've reviewed. OK. Hmm. So I think going back to some of our initial questions, uh, that we had, and, and I do apologize. I'll try to remember them as best I can. I know you weren't here for our first um, meeting on this particular topic, but I, I think there's an inherent uh, concern that there's a strong correlation between um, the use of no knock warrants uh, and uh, increased uh, uh, harm uh, to either police officers or uh, those uh, who are inside the home uh, being um, uh, being entered by the police. Um, and that's and I think that's something that uh, for me would be a very compelling if we could show that it, in, uh, you know, uh, similar cities that uh, do have no knock entry, uh, that that does exist and compared to cities that do not have no knock um that uh, you know the likelihood of uh um uh health related uh you know concerns either through the uh intent itself the short-term impact of entry versus you know long-term uh trauma um if there there is peer-reviewed research on that then i think it would be a compelling uh, argument for us to continue to move the ball forward in a policy recommendation standpoint. Um, if I could just um, yeah, yeah. point you to 
There is a document in there um, from Which the CCJ think? Task Force on Policing. Oh, yes, it's below Starts the rubric, page isn't 12. it? Mm -hmm. Yep, page 12. Um, they do have a list of references, which does include a number of studies. Um, you know, these are not always available online for free. Yeah. But there are there are various studies that have been completed. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And, and just so that way, because uh, this is a new uh, uh, entity for me, the CCJ. Could you could you tell me what that is? Um, I, th I believe they're part of the Council on Criminal Justice, um, okay. which I think is part of the University of Chicago's Crime Lab in their okay. School of Public Policy. Oh, all right, very cool. Um, all right. Um, I, I'd be more than happy to. I don't have anything right now. Uh, more questions, but I'd be happy to open things up to Commissioner Crockett if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, is there like a? Are there like levels to the high risk piece? So, are there are there, are there like standard definitions of like this is termed? you know, low risk and it versus this is like high risk and this. Uh, so the the policies all included no knock as high risk. Um, they also uh, usually defined it as having some other level of high resistance. So a barricaded suspect, armed suspects. Um, that That's where the uh, the high risk definition came in. OK, gotcha, gotcha. And that's that's a pretty like standard um across uh police disciplines is like high risk is gonna be i don't know yeah. people in, um, are involved and can die or something like that i put the policies for the other departments which were referenced in the document in there um and i believe that they all have a definition for high risk that does include um where they expect a high level of, of resistance and no knock warrants yeah um did you see any because one of the major things that I in the last year uh, that this type of conversation usually correlates with is um, uh, Second Amendment and right to defend your home um, sort of laws, uh, stand your ground or castle laws. Um, in your research, did you see anything um, that, uh, you know, uh, brought up the juxtaposition of, of these sorts of laws between no knock policies and uh, castle laws where people are being, um, you know, entered upon without warning. They they have a legal right to defend their home. I'm afraid that that is not something that I came across. Yeah, no worries. Um, it's, it's just something that I've seen in gray literature a lot. So I figured I that, imagine that would normally yeah. be covered by a state law on, yeah. uh, you know, when when uh, force can be used. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the next thing that not to, you know, be too repetitive compared to what we just had in the coaching conversation, but the next thing for me is really, I, I'd love to see, you know, uh, data on, you know, quote unquote success rates of, uh, uh, entry. Uh, no knock entry versus announced entry here in the the city uh, and versus, you know, uh, outcomes of, you know, whether or not, you know, an ambulance had to be called for uh, an individual, either an officer or a civilian on the premise. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of controlling factors, neighborhoods, um, race, gender, stuff like that. Um, number of police officers, even if we have it, you know, any sort of data to be able to um, start to quantify uh, this stuff here in the city of Minneapolis. Um, it, is this, you know, I know I just asked for the world essentially, uh, but uh, what would be the process by going about and getting that sort of information? Is that something that would be feasible? Um, I mean, in relative 
terms of other studies that we've done before? Um, so there is not a public dashboard mm -hmm. that I can see for this. Um, the search warrants do have to be filed with the court. Mm -hmm. So there is at least one place where they are stored, but they aren't broken down just by Minneapolis. It's for the entire county. Yeah, and then I um, assume there are no like, you know, procedural reports that come out, uh, you know, uh, as in like, you know, this is how long the uh, response took. Here's if anybody got in injured, if the ambulance got called, anything like that, that that's definitely not going to be in the warrant itself because that all is preceding the matter, right? Yeah, I believe that would be contained in police reports on the search yeah. warrant itself. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, either you or Andrew or anyone else, is that something that's even within the, the bounds of uh, public disclosure? Um, I assume it is because to a certain degree, there are some things that have been disclosed and a lot of the metrics that I, you know, talked about uh, are similar to, you know, uh, police use of force dashboards, which we have. And, you know, uh, I imagine it is possible to get it. We just have to create that avenue. Yeah, I think one of the things that we did uh, when we were looking at this is we, we tried to go out and see if there was anything kind of similar to what you're describing and like hadn't been able to find anything yet. But, um, but to Chris's point, like there's, you know, like, like a lot of this information exists, just, it, it, you know, in various areas and it's just a matter of like, how does it finding uh, how does it tie together? Um, but it's yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we can, you know, we can certainly look into it. I know the court, um, you know, again, like those records, it's it's just like a, essentially a very long file that, you know, mm -hmm. you, like I mean, so I know that's publicly available. Um, you, you know, by going through that, you would be able to pull out the ones, um, you know, th that were relevant for um, no knock. But then, yeah, as far as like the police reports go, it's just a matter of trying to like, fit, I guess, reverse engineering like what was a, you know, what what was a result of what? Because like we can uh, go through and search some of that information, but it's uh, I, I need to figure out how we determine that like this report was the result of, you know, like a no, you know, the execution of a no knock warrant. So let me, yeah. yeah um, if it's okay, let me. Uh, oh, please. Yeah. And I, I know that's staff, probably you know. a lot to, uh, you, you would have to go through the county uh, and, you know, connect that information to the fact that it was a knock or a no knock warrant. But I mean, if it's feasible to do, I think that would be very informative uh, in a long term perspective. But I know in our last meeting, we talked about both a long term and a short term perspective on this um, of, you know, there seems to be a lot of research that has been done both by uh, Chris, again, thank you very much, um, as well as uh, our presenters from two months ago now. Um, uh, I think if we want to, if there's a desire for it, we could formalize this more into a uh, a short white paper uh, and draft it as a you know informational uh, comparison of you know an analysis of what's going on here in Minneapolis uh, and some of the information that we've pulled from other cities as well as campaign zero and CCJ uh, and put together uh you know uh informed recommendations of what the city could expect if you had certain levels of uh of bans of no knock warrants either from you know the top of this matrix being a a, a complete ban of no knock warrants to um you know required no knock uh, applications going going on through to maybe not all of these, but particular areas that we might find of interest. Um, as you said, Chris, I think a lot of this is state requirements, um, but having that information and being able to share it both with the city and with the state of, hey, this is the type of impact that we could see potentially um, with this sort of um, uh, you know, change in ordinance or change in state law. Um, I think that would be useful and probably not as time consuming as collecting all of this data and, you know, 
uh, making, uh, you know, our own economic model from scratch of uh, saying, you know, here's the, the measured difference between, um, you know, the use of announced warrants and no knock warrants. That was a question, although it definitely looked and sounded like me rambling, but it was a question. I think that uh, again, if I, I know that this was something that you know this entire document in its entirety just got sent over a few hours yeah. ago. So if, you know, if everybody wants to take a second to go through everything and kind of identify if there's any areas, just even looking at the rubric and the notes that we had added in the far right column, yeah. um, you know, where you, know, you feel like it's an you know like, like there's any you know like like issue with like you know either in comparison to other municipalities or a comparison to best practices or the research mm -hmm. that's out there. Um, and identifying some of those areas, you know, like, like to, to your point about a white paper, I mean, that would be something that, you know, I assume at the conclusion of the white paper would, you know, come recommendations. And I think mm -hmm. that if there's some areas you, you've identified based on looking at the other municipalities or the, the rubric, like that would be a good opportunity to kind of call those out and propose, um, you know, some changes. Yeah. Um, like to MPD. So, um, I mean, again, like I don't, you know, just did the analysis, but um, I mean, Chris, do you have, I mean, was there anything that jumped out when we were looking at all of this to you? Um, I, I would say the the only major difference I saw between jurisdictions that allow no knock search warrants and Minneapolis was a lot of the jurisdictions. The other the other three they required supervisor and or attorney approval. Mm. They all they all seem to require supervisor approval. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the I guess just the part you know about Oakland having the the, the reports was pretty useful. Because those uh, inspector general reports are available online, and they take a sample of of search warrants to provide that data. Okay. No, I I think that I mean it. If you're seeing that these three other cities, and uh, you know, we're making the assumption that that you know this is a a, a good representative sample of comparable cities that uh, that you know have a similar practice, but have a major characteristic that is something that we are lacking here. I think that's something that uh, could very well, you know, uh, be seen as a, a, a potential point of recommendation, if not, you know, digging into these a little bit more and seeing where else um, we can come up with some some recommendations. Uh, Commissioner Crockett, uh, it, do you have any uh, thoughts on the idea of a white paper or any, you know, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, yeah. So um, as you're speaking, you kind of went over uh, a little bit more in depth in what I was kind of thinking um, of like the the concept of uh, the police, um, like how police are using their resources for like these no knock warrants. Mm -hmm. uh, versus like that effectiveness and and how we'd be able to you know quantify yeah. that that result essentially because um, I, I think if we can get an understanding of you know how much resources are put into these no knock warrants and yeah. you know if it is a lot of resources and money and then it's not that effective. Um, I think I think that's a a pretty you know strong and valid point. Um, so I, I'd be I'd be interested in kind of understanding how we could get to 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 some sort of point around that. Yeah, that's really interesting. I I I didn't even think about it in the terms of like the cost. Is there a difference in cost uh, just based off of a, an announced warrant versus an unannounced warrant? That would be. And, you know, interesting to see. I, I don't know if it is, but it would be very interesting to see if there is that sort of difference um, because there might be a difference in procedure and a difference in procedure could mean a difference in resources. To that specific point, I would think too, and Chris can um, I confirm or, or add anything, I, because of the, when you get warrants that are classified as high risk, there is that, re that component in the city of Minneapolis that requires SWAT presence. Yep. Um, so, you know, just from a resource perspective, it's like, you know, that that would be one that would, you know, it's just like a surface level analysis that like that yeah. since that's required, there is a, you know, there would be a cost to that. Yeah, so that would be a more like a spurious correlation of uh, uh, as in the no knock warrant isn't the case of 
making it more costly. It's uh, the the SWAT team, and the SWAT team could be there if there's a no knock warrant or if there's an announced warrant. Um, and but you know, uh, understanding that and the the reasons behind that sort of thing of if you have a no knock warrant, it demands a SWAT team. Uh, then and if you have a, an announced warrant, then there may be a difference and and understanding you know those different uh, levers that have to be uh, switched uh, based off of these different categorizations and and the costs associated with them uh, I, I think is definitely a, a a welcome addition. I think that's great Commissioner Crockett. And I, I do think that that some level of that information would be available because the the warrants, as long as they're not sealed and the inventory sheets are filed with the court. OK. Good to know. Um, now, I guess I won't move on uh, directing a white paper right now, uh, although I, I, I think Commissioner Crockett and I uh, and don't, you know, stop me if I'm putting words in your mouth. Uh, would definitely like to move on one soon. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, maybe even, you know, after we've had a chance to look at this a little bit more, um, finalize a few more questions of what we actually want to get out of that white paper and include Commissioner Sparks. We'll, we'll make that directive at the next meeting. That works. I mean, and again, too, between now and then, it's like you can always reach out, um, you know, as you have a chance to go through this and, you know, do some research, you know, do any research you, you know you want to on your own. Um, if you identify areas or have some other questions, I mean, feel free to send them over. Um, and that way we can keep this going. And it's not like we just have to hit pause and then wait until we meet again. Uh, yeah. Keep going. So um, we, I would love to get into the habit of, of doing that more. I want to make sure that this isn't just a, you know, once every two weeks thing. It's uh, getting more in the habit of, uh, you know, would like to have like a, you know, uh, more regular brainstorming session to make sure that we're keeping the ball rolling. Um, let's continue on to the agenda. I completely lost it somewhere in here. Um, that is, in fact, the end of our unfinished business. Um, and we have no new business to address. So with that, um, and all Regina, items. Yes, Chair Pino, a quick question. So you are, are you tabling this to the next meeting? Yes, please. Uh, I will. Uh, there, I mean, technically there were documents to receive and file, so I will uh, ask that the clerk receive and file the most updated document that was provided to us by uh, Andrew Hawkins, uh, and I will table the discussion of no knock warrants to next meeting. Um, so we continue that conversation then. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, we've concluded all items on our agenda for this meeting and seeing no further business uh, before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.